Okay, I will try to make it 45 minutes. I'm not sure whether uh, it's going to be feasible. Uh, if I talk too fast, sorry for that, but uh, well, one lives in a, a fast spacing environment. And uh, I have to correct, I did PhD uh, actually in uh, Vienna, that's why I returned to Vienna. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, well, I've been involved mainly at first, at, I don't know what you said, quantitative uh, research, and now I'm trading inflation, swaps, structured products, and uh, well, what is required. Okay, so. Uh, trading challenges due to new regime. Uh, maybe all the uh, partially it's misleading, uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk about are, let's say, different risks uh, that are um, actually in banking. I will start with banking. Uh, very simple stuff. You know what banks do uh, because I don't know exactly what should be the level. I wanted to, and then I will come to the more complicated topics, and I will just leave the references, references at the end uh, when one wants uh, to, to deepen knowledge, I'd say. Yeah. Maybe I will say a few things uh, that are not on the slides, um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. It's always different timing, yeah? Right, so I will, immediately start with the summary in general. Yeah, that's what's going to be about what, in what state we, are, we were and what state uh, we are going on, we are already. So I, you see on the left, left hand part you have like old world uh, of banking on the right hand side you have new world. And uh, given that I work in the fixed income environment, we deal with all with rates, bonds, you know, deposits, swaps, uh, interest rate derivatives. And we, we, use, we, have different, we use different curves. And uh, in the old world, we have only one discounting and forecasting curve. Okay, I shouldn't have done it this way, but let's say one curve. Uh, Euro is Euribor, uh, US dollar uh, LIBOR, or uh, uh, in other currencies, IBERS or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it does, doesn't matter, it was one. In the new world, we have uh, Ionia and then all kind of different curves, which is like one month. I will explain a bit later, yeah? Then we have we had standard and marg margins. Now we have margin for separate risks. Uh, so it just complicates the way we trade. Before, somebody called you, okay, you can tell price, price almost immediately, yeah? So now somebody calls you, you will ask, okay, do we have agreement? What kind of agreement? Uh, and then you add margin to the price pretty much. So trading becomes more complicated, especially OTC. For standard stuff, it's still, it's still okay, but for OTC, like uh, products where uh, you have, uh, you need really notionals up to one euro, really like coupons that are increasing and, 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 and uh, yeah, such things. Then uh, hardware and software requirements, uh, well, dramatically uh, increased. Uh, I mean, you not only uh, need like lots of hardware, you need like top-notch hardware, but you also need programmers that are able to, uh, they are able to develop application that is going to run efficiently. Yeah? If it doesn't run efficiently, whatever hardware you, wear, you, you have, it's not going to be enough. Yeah? Now, uh, that's concerning the market credit and funding related stuff. Concerning regulatory, little political related, uh, again, this is, uh, you know, with related to Basel uh, 1, 2, 3. There was Basel 1 and 2, potentially now there's Basel 3. That adds, uh, yeah, huge burden to, to, to banks. So they need to employ uh, lawyers, they need to employ uh, into lots of people to risk management, uh, and uh, compliance, yeah. So it's, and you, you will, I will show you one, uh, one, one, one slide where you will, uh, you will see that uh, actually I, I consider them as a trader. I consider them to be uh, money eaters. Yeah. Uh, then, well, over the past, let's say, one year, there are lots of challenges. Banks were sued for, let's say, mis-selling uh, products, or there was this LIBOR scandal that I will try to talk at the end if time allows. And uh, some countries already introduced financial and transactional tax. 
and it is going to be introduced within the European Union, and whether you want or not, it's going to be introduced in Russia because it's the way how the, uh, let's say, uh, government, you know, can well, earn some money as well. Uh, especially when you have uh, that kind of uh, debt levels as in the Europe. Uh, well, reputation in the past was pretty much okay, uh, but now it's really terrible and uh, it's really slowly improving. There are always something going on and, and, and the newspaper media is bashing bands and uh, it's not good because at the end, uh, you will see that I'm going to ask one question at the end and uh, this is very important, I think. Uh, and uh, why, why there's too much pressure is not good on banks as well. So, I will start with this banking, and I thought like I will put this guy here because recently I was uh, traveling in the Algarve. I opened Metro newspaper and I see City Trader retires at 41 with 450 million pound fortune. What the hell? I thought like, uh, <laughs> well, then I read further and I was thinking about it, and uh, well, I can tell you this is not investment banking. Yeah? You will never get that rich. Maybe some of the CEOs got that rich, but you will never get rich. So if you want a uh, few money, don't go into investment banking. Yeah? You can earn reasonable money, but it's going to cost you lots of work and uh, lots of uh, uh, patience and uh, it will take years, but you can have this in life. Yeah? Uh, and well, he's one of the guys that, that was when the growth was uh, really um, in the emerging markets and earned one year 51%, so he was paid on 150 million uh, uh, pounds in a year. But uh, over 2008, 2009, he delivered probably 2%. So, well, you know, but he already got this money. Nobody can claim back. But in the banks, when you receive a bonus, they can claim it back. So you have to be also very careful what you do. Uh, so this is not investment banking, yeah? That's what I wanted to say now. Uh, I will get to the point in investment banking, but I'll just show you just simple, as I see it pretty much. I didn't look into books, but as I see like the major banks and uh, in which space they operate. So we have like lots of uh, universal banks because you take the deposit, yeah? uh, you can provide uh, uh, transactions uh, or you can provide loans to the clients, but at the same time you want to issue maybe some bonds, you know, you want to enhance return to the, to the customers. And then he comes uh, in play the, actually maybe I can have a point in, what should I point here? The range. Okay, here you have investment bank, and I put this thing here, that even the commercial banks and saving banks would like to access some, uh, some, some, uh, some offers from the investment bank. So therefore, most of the banks operate on a universal level. And, uh, well, most of the big banks, obviously. Uh, like Este Group, where I come from, or uh, Spare Bank, and uh, in Germany, London's Bank, and Spain, uh, uh, Kaicha, they, uh, they are mostly retail banks. Uh, they do not want to show, uh, you know, that they have any trading operations, which is complicated. It really complicates the things. Yeah. Uh, but still, they, uh, they they try to provide uh, the issue securities for clients. Yeah. They try to participate on acquisitions and uh, provide market making for certain products. For instance, Este Group is like probably top bank within the central, central Europe. Yeah. So see, well, up to Ukraine because we do not have operation in Russia. Well, at the moment, and who knows? I, I see a huge potential, but it's up to management, I guess. Now, uh, I will I will directly uh, jump to the let's say capital market, which is part of the investment bank. And uh, here I will just split simple three rows for me: external clients, yeah, customers so like retail, hedge funds, institutional clients, and these are actually money providers, yeah. Or I can I can I can tell them tell them that it's service seekers. Well, then you have trading and sales. Well, they see the interaction. There is only error one way here, because uh, trader can come to the customer but cannot really deal with them. Yeah? Usually, all it goes through sales. Yeah. So the first point of contact with sales guy. Uh, he has to know everything about the client, and uh, uh, many times the trading. Well, based on the MIFID already now, you should not know who is the client. Uh, so uh, they try to put walls and they will tell us, let's say, this is the client and this, we have only rating, I don't know, uh, triple B. And based on that, we will price it. 
So you do not know who is the client. You may know maybe after some time, but. Uh, okay, so these are called like sales and trading money generators. Uh, well, and they provide service for the clients, yeah? And then I call this part money eaters. Now, you see lots of boxes, and actually it covers lots of people, and uh, that's the problem in the current environment that uh, uh, you need to employ a huge amount of people and that put pressure on your uh, net earnings. Yeah, because you have to pay people, you have to uh, well uh, educate them, you have to, uh, well, simply it's a, it's, it's, it's a huge burden, I think, and this is, going, this is the main area which, which is expanding. I would say this is trading is shrinking, sale is probably flat, but this is the area which is expanding. Okay, this ALM and funding, uh, you know, there are new de de uh, departments that take care of the uh, ALM is uh, asset liability uh, management, you know, but inflows and outflows, they try to manage it that uh, we have stable funding. Uh, well, trading, for instance, has interaction with all these parts, but sales, you know, when, when they do onboarding, they would, they would deal with compliance, whether the, the client is uh, uh, capable to understand, let's say, the products uh, that you try to sell to them, yeah. Uh, not with risk management, not much. Maybe with operations, no quantitative research, IT obviously, and legal. Uh, so not all of the parts are in, interact with sales, but with trading, every, everybody interacts, yeah. You need, you have some option, uh, or Bermuda option, you execute it, uh, it goes to operation. Yeah? Risk man management is a way of top management to control risks uh, within our books. So uh, these are uh, sometimes not very friendly guys when they call you. Compliance, obviously, you should not sell stuff to Iran. That's an example. Yeah, like uh, because you are going to be uh, charged a fine by FSA or some uh, American uh, American style quantitative research, this is like provides models, IT, well, development plus hardware and legal, obviously. Uh, as you will see later, this is also a very important part because, uh, you know, once you get sued, traders are not going to the court, yeah? I mean, they can go, but, you know, they can, well, they are not going, to, they, they are going to be scared and very difficult to protect themselves without some uh, legal knowledge. Right, okay, that, I think maybe I should speed up. Right, so, uh, I don't know how much, oh, Jesus Christ, uh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, right, so now I start to talk about market risk, uh, all different kind of risks, pretty much market risk, funding risk, uh, basal in between, and uh, uh, legal risk, and uh, uh, well, let's say operational risk. Now, within the capital markets, I can continue, you can have different departments that trade different products. Yeah. And uh, as I come from the fixed income, I will just mention that what, what mainly is done is uh, that you provide to the clients are swaps, which are the exchanges of fixed or floating. Yeah. Somebody takes a loan, uh, let's say uh, normally he pays floating, and he will tell us, okay, but I would like to pay fixed. Okay, so we will exchange. We will take uh, his floating. He is now allowed uh, to pay uh, 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 fixed. And uh, when, when, when we do swap with him, well, with the customer, I mean. Uh, and uh, the main risk is interest rate risk or delta risk. Uh, then the, he can do cups and floors. I don't know whether you know it. Uh, this is like uh, a call or put option on the interest rate pretty much. Uh, so one of the risks you have volatility risk uh, in addition to the curve risk. Uh, so you have a curve that moves and also how it moves, how fast it moves, you know, that's your volatility. And uh, these products depend on this volatility plus the curve, you know, the actual level. Uh, and then you have more complicated products and uh, well, like spread options, so 10 year rate, versus to your rate, and uh, well, maximum, as an example, some Bermuda Leisure accruals. I won't go into detail because now it's already unnecessary. Yeah? Almost nobody trades these kind of products because it's, uh, uh, it was fancy, still has some, there are some hedge funds that do it, but uh, flow just disappeared. There was a period where everybody was doing it, but now it's all done. Uh, and uh, probably this, this, these two things are 
now. Okay, so what changed uh, when I was speaking about this new world uh, from the old world? One of the things, because oh, I studied physics actually, uh, one of the things uh, that people observed in the past and then uh, related it, uh, let's say, to the different subjects like physics is Zeeman effect. Yeah? And uh, here is Peter Zeeman, like young guy, and uh, Henry Lawrence. And uh, the both received Nobel Prize for physics for, well, discovery known as the Zeeman effect, which is here. So like every molecule and atom like absorbs certain spectral lines and this defines the chemical composition. So these are these two lines. Yeah. And uh, when he applied uh, magnetic field, uh, he found out actually that these lines were separated. Yeah. It's depending on the quantum numbers. Uh, and one guy observed that something like this actually happened in the finance. So he related to that. Now, what happened is that we had only one library rate in the past. And uh, we use it for discounting cash flows as well as for forecasting the, uh, the library rates. And uh, there was a split uh, into different curves, yeah? of which held tenors from one day. It's actually, I can move to another slide. Which held tenors of one day till 12 months. Yeah? So 12 months, you have only one. Let's say you invest now and you receive uh, one plus some, well, the same thing that you invested plus something is standard, uh, let's say, deposit. Or you can do it twice. Yeah? Or you can do it four times, or you can do it like every day. So it, every day you give some money to a bank, bank returns to you uh, the following day, and at the same day you just again give money. Now, the, that, that would not be a problem yeah, that we have different curves. One would think that there is no arbitrage or something like this. Yeah? Uh, but what happened that uh, somebody observed that there is some kind of arbitrage, yeah? And uh, that is the next slide. Uh, it's not very visible, at least for me. And what I did, actually here, well, I took this curve, which is uh, three months you rubber, when I took only one period. So I invest over three months, or I can daily invest over three months, yeah? And uh, what they observed, that actually they, they received two different payments. Yeah? And oh, I don't see probably, uh, probably dates. And this was due to Lehman bankruptcy and uh, Berston's uh, bankruptcy, you know. And uh, what actually people realized that banks are able to default within a really short period of time. So there is inherent risk uh, in the fact that if I lend some, somebody or some, uh, some bank money for about three months, actually it may default. But if I lend him just over, over a day, there is small probability of a default. So I, uh, I, should, I should receive actually much more when I lend him for over three months than for over, over a day. So there is inherent uh, credit risk involved in that. And here you don't see, but there is 2%. So the difference actually was almost 2% at the peak of the stress. Um, yeah. Now, uh, again, for trading, this, this actually, this split, this split into different curves became an issue. You were managing risk on one curve. Now you have to manage over all these, let's say, five. But, uh, and, and why, yeah? So before, I don't know whether you know, but for different tenors, yeah, you, can, you could have different rates. I didn't put the numbers, otherwise uh, it would be too confusing, I guess. But let's say I have different tenors, so it's like I can invest for 15 years, I will get a certain rate. Or if I invest for 50 years, I get a different rate. And uh, this was one curve, which was three months Euribor, and now this split into all these numbers. So now you have, like, you're going from 1D too, too deep, pretty much. Yeah. So you increase your complexity. And not only that, you have to generate curves. Yeah, you have to store them. Uh, well, then uh, well, risk management has to take care of it. And in general, risk, well, trading it becomes so much cumbersome. Yeah. Now, as I was talking, this is that, that, that we are going from 1D to 2D. Actually, what happened with uh, vol volatility surfaces? Yeah, because this is at the money uh, at the money surface, just this line. Yeah, this 
uh, shifts over the strike, so you have some volatility surface for different tenors, uh, for different expiries. Yeah. So this this would be volatility, let's say volatility cube, and uh, uh, this was now uh, depending on again this tenor split. Now we have well three three really three di three dimensional space yeah, for for every curve you had uh, different surface and now you can imagine okay I was speaking about the ninety five percent now is in swaps and uh, cups and floors and cups and floors depend on this volatility but uh, the problem is that out of this ninety five percent probably eighty five percent eighty five percent are swaps so really just this delta again and and just ten percent trades in this space so or maybe fifteen percent okay out of this uh, nine uh, the problem is that given that there are not enough transactions, you, have, you, can, you, can, you can see the number, uh, let's say, jumping here, there, 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 on another surface. It's a problem, yeah, because uh, you don't know how it actually looks. So managing this became a nightmare. Right, and this is an example. Uh, how do we trade, let's say, uh, swaps? So as I was saying, now we have multiple surfaces. So this was six months. This is in euros. This is from Bloomberg. Okay, I should say it probably. Uh, this is for six months curve and three months curve. And OIS, I should have mentioned it, that OIS we call uh, this uh, with one day tenor. Yeah? So you have only this three. But we have much more. We have also for 12 months and we had also for uh, one month. But they are also illiquid. Illiquid means that the bit and spreads are much wider. And here I put an uh, example, you know, like Aeonia uh, about, you know, up to 1.6 basis points. One month is already three basis points, two to three basis points. Actually, and most liquid are, are three months and six months, which are 0.3. As you, as you see here, it's like 0.3. Even here, it's probably like, uh, this is 0.7, and this is probably the most, it's one point, uh, in this case, it's 1.1, okay, but uh, yeah. it, it depends on the time of the day as well, but let's say up to 1.4. Um, so what I want to say that uh, now we had, we had one margin. In the past, we had one curve, we had one margin. So, okay, we, it's half basis point in the market. We add half, half basis point, deal is done. Now, uh, you should ask, okay, yourself, Am I able to hedge it in the market? And then, uh, if if I'm able to hedge it, you know, like uh, what kind of mar what kind of margin should I add? You know, depending on tenor, depending on what kind of curve it is under underlying the trade. And well, so become really uh, uh, complicated. It's possible, but uh, it's just it's additional complexity. Right. Now I go to the regulatory risk. That was the market risk. Yeah, so like curve splits, volatility uh, as well, uh, and uh, well, we have lots of issues. Now, regulatory risk. Max asked me to to speak about Basel. I'm not sure whether I'm the best person. I will try to explain uh, as best as I can, and I, I'll start with the history. So, as of let's say August 2011, there is organization chart of the. Uh, Basel Committee on the Banking Supervision, so BCBS, and this is part of the Bank for International Settlements. Yeah. There is a head, uh, well, of the supervision pass governors. Usually, at the moment, you have about G20 governors plus Hong Kong and Singapore. Yeah. And, but uh, when it started in 75, you had about, uh, well, G10 plus, I don't know, few few states. And uh, there are like main parts, the like code parts, like a uh, accounting for uh, task force, like there are sub, let's say, work groups, then this policy development group and uh, standard for implementation group, and they try to interact, and also consultative group, like the, 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 the main parts. They try to create some kind of uh, set of laws, well, set of laws, a set of, um, uh, set of uh, rules, yeah, which are called accords, and uh, that, that actually um, help banks to be stable. 
Now, when it is over done, well, we will see what, uh, what, what may happen. Hopefully, we don't see it, but uh, uh, lots of people feel that it's over done. And uh, you will see in a, in a moment why. So at, at first, it was established in 75, but until 98, uh, well, almost nothing was done. They were just discussing. And then uh, they, they, they produced Basel I, which was, uh, you know, the way how, how do they calculate risk-weighted asset. Like, every loan has certain risk, you know, and they put uh, certain percentages. Okay, if you have a cash, there is no risk. Yeah? If you have a gold, there is also no, no risk. Or the government bonds. Well, now, at the moment, government bonds are no, no longer risk, riskless assets, so it's uh, no longer valid. That's why also they needed, needed to change all these kind of uh, weights. Then they had 20% of the OECD banks. Uh, what I mean by this percentage is that if you have 100 million in cash, uh, that nothing from it is uh, at risk. But when you have, uh, let's say, uh, some uh, let's take uninsured residential mortgages, so out of these 100 millions, 50 millions are at risk. Yeah? So this is a real risk weight asset. And then you had corporate bonds. But the problem, and why it was introduced, uh, as I write here, Basel II, that whether you had rating AAA or BBB, it would not matter. You always had to take 100% as a risk weighted asset, which was uh, ridiculous. Um, then so they introduced Basel II which is already based on three pillars that they state, and it looks at the moment like this. Yeah? So I, uh, I, I, I jumped a bit. Okay. Uh, and uh, based on these three pillars, so how much capital you have available, uh, how much you need, uh, what is your leverage, that would be pillar one. And then you have uh, you know, how much capital uh, you need to take, let's say, in addition, that you are stable, that, that there is no, let's say, systematic risk to the system. Systematic risk, this is pretty much, you know, like, if banks has a problem, it doesn't lend to the customers, doesn't lend to uh, companies, so they cannot invest, and uh, there is a slowdown in the, uh, in the growth. So GDP will come down, there is unemployment, and, well, only, only everybody's in trouble. So pretty much they won't, don't want to achieve that the, that the risk from banking uh, system goes to the real economy. Uh, then you had some liquidity ratios uh, that I will speak uh, about them shortly. And uh, this is like market standards. It means you have to disclose the, you know, how much liquidity you have and what's your leverage ratio and well, number of assets. Simply they have to control you somehow and you have to produce. It's good also for shareholders that they know um, where they stand, whether they should keep the shares in the bank or not. Now, um, so they defined available, available capital. Before, there were several, several tiers, like several different sorts of quality. And uh, now they define the tier one Okay, I can jump. The T1 is pretty much uh, common shares and retail earnings, nothing else. Uh, in the past, there was, there was more. And T2, it's sub supplementary capital. There will be undisclosed reserves, regulatory uh, regulation reserves. But what is interesting is that everybody is now issuing this COCOS, which is contingent capital bond, bond. This, this is a bond when your T1 uh, crosses a certain boundary. Uh, it's no longer bond, it's, it's converted into shares. So pretty much it jumps from T1, T2 to T1. Uh, and subordinated debt. Well, this is the way how they normally calculate, well, we normally calculate T1 capital ratios. So I, I told you what is risk weight asset. Now T1 capital is a common share and retail earnings. Yeah. So you look at the capitalization of a bank and uh, potentially they may not pay dividends, and they will use the dividends as retained earnings. That's what's actually going to happen probably in the future, up to God knows when. Uh, they will just retain earnings. They will not try. They will. Uh, they won't try to uh, pay staff. They will just explain them that we have to satisfy requirements because this is the best for the shareholders. Um, okay, I will come back. Actually, I. I uh, would like to speak about this glo global uh, leverage ratio because the problem 
in the past was like with Lima Brothers, they found out that uh, they were over leveraged. Uh, they, they, they didn't have liquid assets and uh, they didn't have credit lines. Even uh, Bernstein CEO said on Friday, uh, okay, we have 15 billion of uh, liquidity and Monday they were defaulted. So, you know, that's, that's, that's something that uh, uh, they try to introduce like uh, uh, to that this kind of situation do not happen. And uh, the new thing in Basel III is counterparties, which I will later speak about. It's related to the fact uh, that we need to add, as I said, you know, additional margin depending on the credit of the counterparty. So uh, uh, this was uh, transferring risk to not not to transfer risk to the real economy. And there are some additional uh, buffers, as we will see, uh, that uh, that were added uh, to tier one and tier two to protect, you know, to offset some kind of losses. So this one is to offset losses. Um, and uh, another buffer is, uh, buffer is, uh, is, 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 actually I have a slide about it, so um, it's going to be better. If I, so one, one buffer, capital conservation buffer, is just ensure that when there is a downturn, and a downturn that actually bank is normally functioning and uh, okay, uh, they have a problem but they're able to function in a normal way and provide loans and everything. Yeah. And then it's a uh, counter cyclical buffer and it prevents excessive growth. So uh, if you need, if you want to provide more uh, loans to the customers, you have to increase your tier one capital. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, uh, this starts to hit. Um, right, so, so Basel 3 put certain levels of, uh, of common shares that you need to have depending on how much uh, risk weighted assets you have. Uh, now, uh, and this is going to slowly increase. I'm, I'm not going to, this is going to slowly increase. So let's say we have now 2012, but from 1st January 2013, there are certain uh, levels. So we have this ratio, equity divided, or T1 capital divided, or common equity capital ratio, which is common equity divided by risk weighted assets, yeah? So it has, it's going to increase from 3.5% to 5.5%, yeah? Then this capital conservation buffer is going to start hitting in 2016, and then in 2019, it's going to be 2.5% of risk weighted asset. Uh, then, uh, then uh, okay, then there is conservation buff plus conservation buff buffer. So ultimately, the total amount of uh, T1 and T2 capital uh, they need to hold is going to rise up to 10.5 percent. Now, even this number at the moment is difficult to achieve. And how do they actually raise it? They 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 try to issue new shares, or uh, they try to you know retain earnings. But if there is no growth in the economy, there is nothing to keep. And uh, who is going to buy shares now? You can ask. There are lots of issues, and people pretty much lost money. I used to work for RBS. We had issue. Okay, I participated, and it lost probably 50%. So great trading. Uh, obviously, when it was the first opportunity to sell it, everybody sold it. So again, price fell down. It was, so it's uh, it's really it's really a problem. And you see, this is going to last till 2019. And every year, pretty much, they have to do something about it. So I, uh, honestly, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah the nothing is that this crisis uh, is not going to last. You know, like some people say, it's going, to, it's done. This is just going on and on and on and on until you know the system is cleaned. So this is a big worry because, uh, as it was announced last week, there will be 10,000 people uh, made redundant from UBS. So the people with experience will come to the market. And now, uh, if you ask me, if, if I'm boss somewhere, like whether I'm going to employ a graduate or uh, some, uh, some guy who knows what he's doing, well, sorry, but uh, either graduate is going to be incredibly cheap, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, so I can pressure graduate, and I can pressure also uh, the guy that is in the market, because I will tell him, oh, come on, I can take graduate, or I can take uh, some people from the market, and there are lots of people, and I can choose. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, really a pressure on uh, total compensation in general. 
So there is no inflation in, uh, in, uh, in terms of the uh, earnings, which is also bad ultimately at the fact that, uh, okay, if I do, do, do not have enough money, I cannot buy enough goods, I cannot buy flat for myself or my family, and uh, then the economy cannot be growing. So it's like really wheels are not turning, which wheels somewhere stopped. Yeah. And um, then, uh, okay, I didn't speak about these uh, liquidity ratios. Um, which are over here. That's actually what happened with uh, Northern Rock in the UK. Uh, when they started uh, speaking about uh, the fact that Northern Rock can have a problem, everybody went to a bank and wanted, out ca wanted to take out cash. Now, if many people do it, it's a problem because money are invested, these in uh, instruments are low for a long period, and uh, so they have to lend it for somebody else, and it is costly. So ultimately, they, they uh, well, pretty much defaulted. Uh, they were taken over by the uh, government. And uh, so this, this kind of liquidity ratio, um, and uh, uh, do I have it? Okay. So it requires the banks hold enough uh, assets to cover expected net outflow during like 30 day uh, stress period. So they can survive for 30 days, you know, uh, savings are, some savings are coming in, uh, also something from investment. At the same time, people are taking out money and they can survive this period. So this is one stress test. So it's one ratio. So they can able to simulate how much money are disappearing and also how much money are coming in and they have to survive it. So. Again, you see, once you need the model, you need to employ somebody who understands it and who is able to do it. Then a uh, net stable funding ratio, which, is, which prefers long-term funding versus short-term funding. Short-term funding, you can get it from, uh, from other banks, and this is also related to uh, one of the graphs that I pointed earlier uh, in here. So pretty much, when you invest over one day, that's short-term funding. When you invest over a few years, it's a long-term funding. So if you are able to borrow for 10 years, it's good for you. It's long-term funding. They would like to promote it. If you, if you try to uh, borrow for one day and then another day, and it's a short-term funding and they don't want to promote it. They will punish you, actually. Um, right. Uh, this, this is like a like summary. Pretty much, I said almost everything in other words. Uh, and uh, one, one thing that I didn't mention, that you need uh, uh, some kind of model that you can uh, simulate uh, uh, all these risks. And uh, as I will see later on, these risks are related, let's say, to the credit and funding. And uh, the problem is that uh, once they put on all these uh, requirements and you calculate how much capital you, you need, certain part of the businesses are no longer uh, viable. It means that uh, you are losing money while you are, uh, uh, while you are doing this business. So some of the businesses is going to disappear. And uh, probably Basel III will yearly cost about 0.15% of GDP. It's not a lot, but if you have 0% uh, growth environment, well, actually, then we go into negative numbers. Now, if I come back again in here, and I look, I didn't speak about all this kind of stuff, counterparty risks, uh, potential credit risk. They are all related to uh, pretty much uh, credit and uh, risk-weighted assets. And I'm going to talk about uh, f funding risk. Uh, well, it's partly related also to these uh, ratios. Uh, and, and I will be following with the counterparty risk. Now, so now you already see that doing trading is pretty much, you have to know uh, lots about the risk because what, what trading does, it manages risk for, for the company. Now, when you have standard deal with the client, yeah, so this is the part when you have deal with the client. So let's say he pays fix, he pays floating, uh, it's just, just an example. And then uh, you hedge it on the market, 
So you, you pay it in the market fix and receive floating and you're trying to earn some kind of fee. And this is usually uh, given, uh, well, all is based on some kind of agreement between two counterparties. This agreement is, uh, is the agreement and part of this uh, credit support annex. Uh, I think in the past there was Mr. Peterberg, he talked about it, I guess, a bit. And uh, so I'm maybe going to repeat certain things that I hopefully add. <clears throat> right. So credit support annex, uh, there are certain, let's say, it specifies that uh, trade evolves, yes, uh, somebody's in the money, somebody's out of the money. And it specifies that what to do uh, with the fact, uh, let's say, that there is a deviation from zero. Yeah. So m maybe some of the counterparties should post me uh, something, suppose some cash or bonds or something that uh, covers actually their loss. So if, if it's, let's say, a deal with most, which most corporates are and sovereigns, there is no CSA. So there is, there is no exchange of any money. Yeah. If it's asymmetrical, also one-way CSA, some sovereigns, agencies, supranationals, really like, which operate on the global levels, usually it's a benefit to the counterparty, not to the bank. So actually, it is even worse. Yeah. So if it goes, uh, for, if, 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 if the counterparty is already earning some money, we, banks has to pay. And now we think, well, okay, if we pay, but we don't have actually cash or we take it from the deposits, we need somehow incorporate it into our pricing. So we charge upfront. And yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, that it's my, pricing something is no longer simple. We think also about this kind of stuff. And uh, if it's two-way, it's fine. This is among the big banks, for instance. And now everybody's pushing towards this way because if you have two-way, it means that uh, uh, if banks is in the money, it means uh, earns money on some uh, product, then counterparty delivers cash. If it crosses zero, now it goes ne negative numbers, uh, we post cash. Now you have to model it again. Uh, that's, that's again problem of uh, quantitative research. Uh, how do you model it? Uh, so knowing it is, can be very beneficial for somebody who tries to enter uh, industry. Now uh, the CSA next, next to the type, I mean which way this collateral flows, provides also ad additional details like how often do we look at the, uh, at, the, at the NPV, net present value, or what would be the threshold? If it's zero or if it's 10 millions, if I have some deal with corporate that may be two-way CSA, but I have 10 million or God knows maybe uh, 100 million, then for me virtually uh, this is like, uh, depend, uh, this is like having no CSA because it would take a really big move uh, until uh, the threshold is satisfied, until somebody posts the uh, collateral. And uh, that, that's an issue because, uh, you know, like maybe it's uh, seven million, they default, all money are gone. Yeah, nobody's going to pay you. And then uh, it can be cash or bonds or uh, different currencies, so again, it complicates things. And, uh, it it's really becomes a nightmare to calculate it all the time. Um, it specifies also that, okay, if I receive cash, actually it should be benefit, beneficial to the client because, uh, you know, like uh, he gave us cash, we can do whatever with it. And uh, it was defined that uh, some, some kind of rate we paid on this cash. So when we return this money back to the client, actually he's not losing uh, much because we pay him Eonia or Fed funds, depending on currency, or we agree on the rate that we pay. And uh, there are other things like netting portfolio, portfolio. so when the counterparty, uh, let's say, defaults, and in one trade we are positive, in one trade we are negative, they can offset each other. Yeah. Right. So pretty much, uh, I already explained all the all this kind of stuff that we, it can have it, it can be when there is no CSA some funding benefit or some funding uh, costs and uh, that that one has to actually simulate I guess oops now that was the uh, funding risk and the credit risk that the counterparty can default let's say 
we'll, example, we lend 100 million, bank uh, is expecting 100 million at the end of the loan, yeah? So the risk is 100 million. For some transaction like a derivative, it's marked to market. So now any transaction actually has certain level of risk. That's why Basel III also defines certain weights. But here we are able to calculate based on the counterparty a probability default, how much is the risk, as you will see in the second. Now, uh, this is done by CVA, which actually gives you some kind of mean value uh, which is invested, uh, that how much of this, uh, let's say, value is put at risk. And uh, the way how we calculated the CVA, so this charge, uh, if you take the recovery rate, so how much of the, let's say, even when the counterparty default, they have some, uh, they have some uh, buildings that they can sell. So maybe 10, 20, up to probably 50% can be recovered uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the overall deal, let's say. And then uh, this is the expected positive exposure. It is how much exposure we have. It's positive because uh, it's from my point, uh, it is negative. So I have to give somebody money. Well, for me, it's fine if the counterparty defaults because I don't have to give them money. So, you know, only what matters is when it is positive for me. Yeah? So I, I expect some money from, 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 from the company. So why it is expected posi uh, positive exposure. And then there is a de probability of default. Uh, it means that depending on the credit rating, you can say, okay, in 20 years' time, you have about 25% chance uh, to, to default. And if you put it all in, that's the simple formula, and you will get the uh, answer at how much we are going to charge for your credit risk. Now, this is more complicated formula. This is what is done in pretty much in, in practice and uh, where we simulate at each individual point how much uh, there is exposure. And uh, we try to sum all these exposures. So pretty much we are integrating, uh, integrating uh, the space under the curve and we multiply it with the default probabilities. It's pretty much the same formula, just a bit more compli complicated. So I was I was I was talking about uh, well maybe I can mention that the trading challenges as I was mentioning in the hardware I was working on some stuff and if the if the swap was calculated like in 10 to minus five second but we had like millions of swaps uh, that would become uh, several seconds yeah and uh, when we have a complicated product like Bermudan and we have thousands of Bermudans. Again, this will become thousands of seconds, or maybe 10,000 of seconds. But once you have a deal with counterparty, it's a problem because uh, they want to know price now. Now, how do I calculate price, price now if I have to wait 15 minutes for somebody to calculate me CVA? And uh, so there is a huge demand for, for people that I actually understand um, uh, well, not only software, but also hardware, you know, how to set up networks and, and that they are efficiently calculating. Cost of implementation, obviously. And ultimately, somebody has to explain customers that our margin incorporates, let's say, the hedging that requires for us to hedge in the market, then some liquidity, so the funding risk, and uh, some credit risk. And uh, this has to be explained to the clients that, well, in the past, maybe we were charging one basis points, but now we are going to charge five because this is this and this is this, approximately. I mean, uh, uh, they already see you know, what's the quote on the market and what do they get. And this incorporates uh, all these kind of risks that, that we mentioned. Now, when we close early, in general, we should release certain things that we already charge. Now, uh, so that that's actually uh, can be quite uh, cumbersome because uh, uh, when somebody calls again, they want to know uh, the price now. And if we have lots of trades with them, uh, if we re release really what we charge at the beginning, then uh, we, we can have a problem because we have still lots of uh, uh, lots of lots of deals with them. So it's a really complicated uh, subject. Um, okay, I speed up a bit. Hopefully it was understandable. Uh, there were in the in the uh, in the past uh, few uh, few issues. 
And uh, as I try to tell you, everything now is complex. Yeah? And uh, there was recently a problem with selling of uh, payment protection scheme. So when somebody was uh, borrowing money, in, it was incorporated already in some scheme that uh, when he is not able to repay mortgage, for instance, or credit card, uh, they will pay for him over a certain period. But the, uh, the problem was that uh, um, almost nobody got, uh, when, when, when really somebody got a problem, really it was a really small percentage of the clients that were able to really uh, get something from this insurance. It's quite unlucky, I have to say, that there is Barclays involved in both of these uh, kind of uh, things. And, uh, and they actually are probably going to make laws, probably they already announced, and uh, lots of other banks are involved. But it, what I want to say, total cost of this thing was nine billion uh, pounds. Yeah. And uh, it's a huge amount of money that, was, uh, that banks uh, have to pay. So now consider all these basic requirements. Uh, now this problem, uh, lots of money are really like going out of, uh, out of banks, but almost nothing because of the growth that is missing, nothing is coming in. So it's uh, really lots of uh, pressure. That's why uh, banks are not willing to give my, uh, money out to the real, real econ uh, economy because they have to patch all these black holes in, in the system they have. And uh, <clears throat> another one, they were uh, sued for selling even such simple things like swaps or some structured products like this Lobo. And uh, um, that's, that's, that's partially compliance and uh, a kind of legal issue because uh, they were not telling clients, for instance, that they have, should seek independent advisor, whether, whether the customer is really, really want this kind of product. They didn't explain enough risks. Now, obviously, now customers are coming back, and uh, let's say they, they need cash, they want to close the deal, and they have to pay five million. And uh, well, if, the, if, we, if they pay five million, they will just default. And so, so it's, they're trying to sue banks for, for, for the products that they were selling. Because uh, if, as I said, if it's not, let's say, in the agreement with the customer, because RBS recently even won uh, the court case where they really explicitly in the contract that they should seek independent advisor. And, all of, and I know probably new information out of probably 50, uh, 45 uh, deals, 90% of Barclays deals uh, were actually tr um, dismissed because uh, uh, so so it's 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 ongoing pro ongoing thing, but uh, it's it's really so much uh, complicated when you interact with the client. It's really uh, you have to you have to know your client. You have to understand what it needs. You have to uh, um, show him uh, all the risks that are involved. Uh, otherwise, you can get into trouble. So that's another reason why banks are not really uh, keen on uh, doing that much business as before. Uh, this is example with uh, Lobo that, that were sued. And uh, the last thing I would like to show is the LIBOR scandal. Yeah? This is the discussion. Uh, this is one of the head traders uh, where I used to work. And they had a, they had a discussion like, uh, uh, and he asked, what's the call on the LIBOR, blah, 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 but at the end, one of the traders said, okay, I will move the curve down by one basis point, maybe more if I can. Now, uh, obviously, this is not what we would like to hear in the, in the, in the, uh, during the conference call, because uh, once the FSA uh, got it, well, this is going to create like, and goes to the newspaper or somewhere, this is going to be a huge problem. Yeah. And uh, it also shows that there is uh, too much pressure on the people working in, in banks you know, to generate profits. And uh, then, they, then they do not the things that they would normally do, let's say. Um, uh, okay, so I, they were able to move maybe the rate by a few basis points, so it was not really the one it should be. And uh, they maybe uh, earn lots of money, but they were doing it probably for a prolonged period. Obviously, they were sued uh, or they were fined by the uh, regulatories. Okay, uh, Barclays is ongoing issue. Uh, well, RBS is ongoing issue. Barclays was already uh, paying 360 million 
uh, in the US and 60 uh, million in, uh, in, in, in pounds. But uh, well, uh, then there was a report, it's called Whitley Report, that made actually these kind of things um, criminal. So you can go to jail because of that. So traders should be very careful what do they say, probably from now on, uh, <laughs> if they were not already in the past. Uh, even my boss told me that uh, maybe I should not tell everything what I, sh what I want to tell. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> right, so th they even created a new authority that's going to oversee the overall process and the banks have to keep the records of their transactions. Now, uh, I will get back to the summary and I will ask only one question. So overall, what is your feeling? Who is going to pay for it? Well, the answer is uh, I'm going to help you is the customer because either it's going to be a regular guy, you know, who has an uh, account in a bank or via the fees. Let's say you open an account now, you, let's say in the UK, you do not pay for the account. I don't know how it is in Russia, but for instance, in the Eastern Europe, you pay for the account. Let's say you pay for the, when you, when you, when you put your money on your account, yeah, or you, when you take out some money, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you pay something. It's a little bit, but you pay for it. And uh, it's not only that, it's, it's, it's all of this. So any customer that comes to the bank uh, can expect that actually all the financial uh, services will probably become more expensive. And now, uh, it's because of the problems that were in the banking, it's, it's because of the regulation, but uh, ultimately, you know, it, uh, it will probably create inflation that everybody expects. Yeah. Now, there are some references, so thank you for your talk. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Well, that's that's the problem that you know, like uh, maybe the decision. Well, it well it could be probably U.S. specific that if they helped, uh, if they had uh, the end customer, you know, 
then uh, the end customer will start paying the mortgage. It will then propagate back that the quality of mortgage pool is going to be better. So they, they wouldn't have that much write downs. So it will be propagated from the bottom up, not from the top down. Yeah. So it's a different approach. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not. It's up to clever. People, let's say clever people uh, that were there at the, t at the time, and uh, the decision they were seeing that they have to patch. You know, first banks because governments need banks. Uh, government uh, is not able to survive without banks. When they when they try to sell uh, bonds, government bonds, they call a bank. Yeah. Uh, then banks uh, maybe take some commission, but uh, still, you know, uh, governments do not help people to do it. There was, there were already attempts in uh, in in UK, let's say, that they will create a separate entity that will try really promote uh, corporates. So they will try to sell loans to small and medium businesses, but uh, yeah, there are no results yet. So that's uh, that's the different way of doing kind of things yeah, and so one thing is really like helping in the client and propagating upwards another thing is uh, um, yeah really uh, too much dependence maybe of the governments on on, on, on banks yeah but uh, that's not going to I think change yeah you, you need yeah you need both pretty much um, no, I, I actually, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe there was a fashion because, you know, like if you started, let's say, in some company and you saw that everybody around you is doing it, okay, you try to do it as well <laughs> because you think it's the best product. But uh, it's no longer the case. People realize that actually maybe we can enter a product that is probably less complicated. We would understand risk because you, it, you may not even have a model to, to you just. No, that's, that, that's what it should be, but you don't know exactly. And then you realize, oops, but it's not what I expected. Yeah? And that's why how, they, how, they, how the losses were made. Uh, and uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's why all these exotic, you know, so you know now all these exotic models maybe. Uh, lots of stuff you can pretty much forget because uh, nobody's interesting anymore. Okay, the, uh, I mentioned at the end this Lobo, which I didn't explain. Uh, this is actually, uh, well, from my, my point of view, simple product, but uh, it's a Bermudan. So you have even correlation rates. So you have uh, curve risk, you have volatility, but you have also correlation before, because usually you calibrate to uh, coterminous options. Uh, and uh, and in, in this deal, you know, it's it's simple, simple loan that the client takes, yeah? And he pays floating, but he doesn't want paid floating. He wants to pay fixed, like like here. Okay, just ignore the rest. Uh, so it, we enter into a, uh, into a deal with the bank where uh, we pay client floating, so that it offsets each other, and we, they pay us fixed now, but it has step up coupon. Yeah? That's the problem. Uh, because uh, we expect, uh, we, do, we do a deal and we expect probably more fr uh, from that, but they have a right to exercise so they can decide. If we do not like, like this fixed coupon, we can exercise it, we can cancel the deal. Yeah? But at the same time, they have to repay the loan at the same time. And then probably they have 12 months or so. And uh, that's, uh, that's one of the products that is lots of investors would understand. And people or banks are able to provide the risk. But uh, when you deal with really 
the small companies like the St. Petersburg municipality, you don't have people that would understand it probably and it would be very difficult to sell something like this. Uh, and uh, even when you sell, there must be so much interaction now because you want to be, uh, pretty much you want to cover your ass yeah, if something happens to, to this deal. So uh, this kind of thing, it can decrease funding of St. Petersburg when they want to build bridge or when they want to build roads, but uh, it's going to involve lots of uh, energy uh, for, for, for a bank to explain it and uh, to provide uh, um, really uh, good quality, I would say, uh, uh, service. And uh, that was probably not done uh, in the past. Yeah? And then, then, then uh, now we, we need to have really specialized on these things. And they understand it and they're able to explain it also to regular people. Let's say. So uh, yeah, you can forget about the exotic products and <laughs> concentrate on simple stuff that, that because even swaps, as I said, which is just exchanging of fixed and floating cash flows, there you have so many risks and you need to build their models. That's why uh, Mr. Peter Garbark uh, was saying that uh, uh, he's, uh, he's head of the department of Berkeley's capital, yeah, uh, research department. And uh, they have already lots of, uh, uh, let's say, Russian-speaking uh, people there. And uh, because, uh, let's say, Russian has tradition that lots of people are able to program something, and, uh, and this, is requ this is required. Yeah. So they, uh, that there, is, uh, there is still opportunity. It's just uh, you have to ask yourself whenever you approach company that what can I bring to the company when they hire me, okay? They will pay me salary, that's fine, but what do I bring? Do I just, am I going to be just a regular guy moving papers from one corner to another corner or I'm going to really deliver something, yeah? So, I mean, that's, 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 that's how I, if I go somewhere, I, I know that, okay, uh, I did, uh, inflation, I know how it works, I know people. I go there and I say, okay, well, I, I would like to, you know, expand uh, inflation business because of that, that, and that, that, yeah? I don't go there because, you know, like, well, I did something and, you know. So, yeah, well, do you have any other question? All right. Okay. Well, given that I heard that uh, St. Petersburg, uh, I underestimated. I think St. Petersburg has five million people. Then uh, that. Well, I'm not going to surprise that they will just uh, try to do it that way because this is, well, uh, I think if, if they already sold everything in, in, <laughs> in the city, maybe they will try something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why I think there's opportunity here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to release them. <laughs> uh, which guy? Oh, God. I'm just curious. Look at look at him. He's 41, yeah. And uh, he's just retiring. No, no, no. He's not 21 at this picture. He's actually 41, yeah. <laughs> Well, yes, of course. Well, well, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. First question is that also in the let's say this thing didn't change. The trading has to have control about all the risks, uh, also the overall process. If they do not have control, 
uh, about the risk, who has. Yeah? I mean, uh, in the management, usually are not people that understand all these processes. Yeah? Or maybe when they understand it, they do not understand details. So the trading should understand also details behind it. That's why uh, traders are constantly trying to educate themselves and read all the stuff because uh, to keep up with the pace. Um, yeah. Uh, concerning whether uh, anybody can become uh, the rich, well, yes, obviously, yes, they can. Uh, just consider, you know, uh, Facebook. You, you had no growth environment. This guy became rich. It, or you mean in the financial industry? <laughs> um, <coughs> right. <coughs> I think it's no longer the case. <coughs> I think uh, in the financial industry, <coughs> <coughs> all the costs are going to be part of the equation. So, uh, <coughs> excessive. <coughs> Excessive payouts, actually, it's uh, music of the past. That's what I think. <coughs> I hope the camera is switched off and, and my management. <laughs> and, and, and the management doesn't hear it because uh, yeah. <coughs> you, you, you certainly expect certain, let's say, range. But uh, excessive bonuses, like the traders were getting uh, several millions, maybe they can get it. But uh, they must be really covering probably all the departments, uh, like as of right here. They will cover probably the head of the capital market, yeah. <coughs> and uh, so they, but it's not going to be in terms of the hundreds of millions, but it's going to be probably in terms of the few millions <coughs> that they can receive in, the, in terms of the compensation. And obviously then, uh, uh, when, even when they receive bonuses, it's going to be in terms of either debt, yeah, so they have risks. It's going to be a clawback. So if, if there is a problem, it will be cut, let's say, 95% or 100% clawback, which means that you get 5 millions, something happens, it will take you 5 millions. So, yeah, <coughs> that's what's happening. Or they will just give you shares. And you can sell shares after 5 years or after 7 years. And uh, now imagine that your incentive, so it, it also means for you, that if you leave the company, you are no longer going to see the shares. Because uh, so they try to keep you within the company. So uh, in, in the past, there were people that were jumping from one job to another job, yeah? just to improve position or improve salary and something. And now it's trying to kind of stabilize. Everybody tries to keep job and uh, <coughs> to see what happens. But. Um, no, I, I think excessive payouts uh, already come to an end. And also, Basel 3 speaks about it. I think that they limit about a bonus, I think bonus at 100% or something like this of your salary. Thank you. Thank you.